In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit, and the Holy No, my memory has been known to fail me. I said. So we had the, the older handouts at seven and eight, but I didn't have any commentary for eight and seven was pretty much uh, um, enjoying the beauty of between God and the church or God and myself. So the book of song of Solomon is about the sacramental relationship, the mystical relationship, the non-physical relationship between God and the church. The physicality of it comes in the peak of it when he started the, the whole um, book by let him kiss me by the kisses of his mouth and then he will end the book come quickly i want you to come jumping on the on the hills which is the very last verse like a stag like a young stag long, long, young as hell so it's calling god for incarnation to come and save us so the book of this love relationship which is could be a reason for attack on the Bible is exactly what people misunderstand about the book of uh, Song of Solomon. So if we, I'm gonna read, uh, uh, we'll read together chapter seven. <coughs> I might, I'll read it because I will stop in some places. And then we'll start chapter eight. And there is a two page, hand, two page handout because we'll take quite a bit in the first four verses of chapter eight. We'll lead into, into it by seven. So, Song of Solomon, chapter 7, <clears throat> whenever you see the physical description, it's because God will be incarnate, and it is not about I love you just uh, in the air, but there, there is a very, very clear description of, of this love. How beautiful are your feet and sandals, O prince's daughter! The curves of your thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a skillful workman. So the fashioning of your soul is the work of God, is a, is a uh, fashioned skill, skilled workman. Your navel is a rounded goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. Your waist is a heap of wheat set about the lilies. So 7 verse 2. The fathers looked at this goblet and said it's the goblet of communion that, that the church. So this is the Lord looking at the beauty of the church. He's the one who fashioned the church and he's praising the church, the beauty of the church. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins or a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. The, we're going to see that in chapter 8, this breasts is going to be commented on by St. Ambrose why he's describing the church in this motherly fashion. Uh, but the rounded goblet, because it, the church gives us communion, so the fathers look at this rounded goblet, it's the goblet, it's the chalice of communion. It's, it's where we get the sustenance for our survival, that we can't, we can't abide in eternity unless we have the communion. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of, of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower which means the church is never defeated. The church is always going to win. Um, in fact, the name of the Lord, the, the name of the Lord is described as a tower because it says that the saint runs to that tower and takes refuge. So where are we going to take refuge except the church, nowhere else? So here he's describing the church in this tower description. Your eyes like the pools in Heshbon, and we said this Heshbon, one of the cities uh, of the king of the Amorites. And next to it is the gate of Basrabim, attached to Heshbon. Lots of pools, um, sustenance, water, uh, even as kings take pleasure in ornamenting their city as um, beautiful as lakes and so forth. So the church is also, if the Amorites or the non-believers build this beautiful city, how much more is the city of God? And the city of God is a book that uh, St. Augustine wrote of, 
about the, the eternal eternal life and the eternal life is is on earth by by the church your nose is like the tower of lebanon which looks towards damascus can see everything and again the, the image of a tower is the image of power your head crowns you like mount carmel and the hair of your head is like purple a king is held captive by your tresses tresses is the locks of the hair of a long hair are called tresses so all of this beauty is what god sees in us god sees in the church because the church is not just a building the church is beautiful by by the congregation this is the church of the new testament saint peter t tells us that we are living stones we're not just a building uh, in the tabernacle it was a building and the way to build the building uh, symbolizing the royalty the incarnation now in the church the, the shape of the building is very well known it's the cross or it's the noah's ark or it's rounded for the eternity um, but what beautifies the church is really the people in it what well, the iconostas is telling us through windows to heaven these are the ones who made it seek their prayers seek their lifestyle let them be examples in front of you so the iconostas is not a veil it's a carrier of icons and the icons are windows to heaven because if I want to get to heaven, I should follow the lifestyle of these people on the iconist as they made it, they are successful. So it's in, as we see Christ, we see the people who are successfully with Christ. No, no, no qualms about it. Samiri, St. John the Baptist, the, the intercessor of the church. Archangel Michael, obviously, they are the, the, the commonality between the heaven and earth. You have to have the, the Bashara or the Annunciation next to St. Mary, and you have to have next to Christ St. John the Baptist. These are not optional icons in any orthodoxy, in any orthodox church you find that order. And then others, the intercessor of the church and any other intercessor follows on both sides. So this, this image, the Holy Spirit who writes this book sees it in the church. Because the Holy Spirit knows the solution because he knows that the Son will take flesh. So when he looks at the church, and looks at the beloved, that's the beloved of God, the church, you. Um, he just cannot just say a couple of words. He, he basically goes into all of the descriptions of different body parts, but it's not body parts physically, is, is what intended. It's, the, it's the, 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 the mystical love and union between God and man. So verse 6 in chapter 7, how fair and pleasant how pleasant you are O love with your delights in chapter seven <clears throat> this statue of yours is like a palm tree palm tree and the song tells us that the saint will will glow or will be high like a palm tree very very straight and it's found in a desert it can bring fruit in a desert this is an advantage of especially the palms and of course in areas like this uh, the book is written to relate to where it's written at for example the book of revelation we can see saint john writing to the seven churches in ephesus because he preached in ephesus he worked in ephesus uh, in asia sorry in asia seven churches in asia asia minor which one of them is ephesus so when the when the holy spirit inspires someone to write his part of the writing um, not 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 being obsessed with the holy spirit and just dictating not knowing what he's doing um, and um, we notice this in the gospels very very much that they are thank god they are different thank god they may seem contradiction between them and there isn't Actually, one time when we finish this uh, song of solomon we're going to do harmony of the apparitions of Christ on the day of the resurrection because they mean they may be uh, confusing but we can really harmonize it so what gets attacked on the Bible as being the Gospels are in contradiction in fact this is one of the biggest proofs one of the biggest um, motives for us to say it's not and it's written by four different people otherwise if it's cut and paste by four people of the same account and it's the same then it's uh, then it's one 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 writer just giving them different names so here we see the palm is related to where the Bible is written, is related to the desert, is related to the, the area <laughs> that's lived in. So Lebanon, Heshbon, um, Damascus, uh, it doesn't say anything about Egypt because this is not where Solomon reigned. 
So we can see here, uh, it's completely relevant to where the book is written and who wrote it. And your breast, like, like its clusters, I said uh, we're going to, to, to focus on this breast and nourishment in chapter eight. I'm just repeating seven because it's all description. Um, the mystical work will come more in eight. I said I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. Let now your breast be like clusters of the vine. It's not dates, it's vine. So he's describing now why clusters of vine. Why do we think we're talking about the wine here? Because of exactly there's no other there's no other message that the Bible is trying to give in the Old Testament than God will come as a king, king of Israel by incarnation. But king on my soul is to get me back to him into the wedding in paradise. And he will do this not just by coming and crucifying himself by his will, but in order to let me be part of him. This is the whole goal of, uh, of salvation. And that's why Christ on the cross has to give me after it himself because his blood that came out of him is going to make this blood last forever and I can have it any time in the church, have him any time in the church through his body and blood. The fragrance of your breath like apples and the roof of your mouth like the best wine again. So he looks at the church because it's going to supply, she is going to supply us with the Lord. So the church is beautiful. The church is the body of Christ. So this is the love relationship. And, and you being part of the church, you look like this. This is how God looks at you. So you never, you never pray and say that God doesn't love me or has any issue with me. This is whenever you open your mouth and whenever you talk to God, he looks at you exactly like this. This is how he perceives us. We misperceive ourselves because of our sins and weakness. But we should not let this stop us from looking at the Lord because the, he doesn't look at us the way we look at ourselves. He looks at us much, much, much better. So the church responds. Of course, we, we love God and we tell him the following. The wine goes down. You see the wine, the vine, all of the same recurring theme of this juice, this unending, unending wine that the Lord will give us. In fact, in another, another places we see that he, he takes her to the house or he takes the soul, the beloved, to the house of wine. The house of wine is where the wine never ends. And that is the infinite communion. This is the kingdom of heaven. And when we have communion, it doesn't wear off. It just uh, doesn't, it loses its effect, not because of the communion has a, a time period where it works, but it's because of our actions, whether we invest with the communion or we, uh, we clip it, we clip uh, the work of God inside us. So it's up to us how long the communion can last, one day, the whole week. Um, so may God give us at least the day of Sunday, we can keep it without any, any sin, so we can enjoy the communion for one day. The wine goes down smoothly for, for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. These are the ones who are sleeping in the, in the love of God. Like they don't want anything of the world. They're completely intoxicated. Any, any comment or any addition or uh, any modification? I don't know if we lost the connection, sorry. Verse 11, chapter 7. Come, my beloved. So this is Christ to you. Just listen, this, these words are to you. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the field. Let us lodge in the villages. So God has work for me. We're not going to be sitting lazy. What is that work? I want us to be alone together. I want you to enjoy the heavenly thinking. I want. I don't want you to be distracted or depressed by the problems of the 
what happens to you in the world. Let us go to the field, let us lodge in the villages, let us see the saints, let us go from one, from one garden to another. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine has budded, whether, whether the grape blossoms are open and the pomegranates or roman are in the bloom. There I will give you my love. So all about prophecy. Remember, this is written when the communion is not given. So he's giving us different aspects of it. Is that when I come to church, I'm with Christ in the fields. I'm alone with him. I talk to him and he doesn't talk to just me as part of the congregation, but me alone. That's why every person takes communion, not a sample. Or not, um, or not uh, something symbolic. It's every person has Christ in, in them. The mandrakes give off a fragrance, at, and at our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner new and old. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Um, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away, and now everything is new. In Second Corinthians five seventeen, it's a very very key verse. Anybody who's in Christ is a new creation. You read this, you read this chapter, and, and just all about newness. So we want to we want to see that the incarnation, that to be in Christ is not symbolic, is real, and He planned this. So, so He's telling us. When he comes, he will take me to the fields, he will take me to the vineyards, he will, meet, he will give me communion over and over in different, in different ways. So remember this, this, this verse very well, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anybody is in Christ, is a new creation. All things have passed away, behold, everything is new. So where, where does the oldness come from? The oldness comes from when I go back to my old ways. And he says, all men are new and old which I have laid up for you, my beloved. So the Old Testament righteous people will get to the kingdom of heaven, will be renewed. They are not going to be old and it's over. Represented by the 144,000 in chapter 7 of, of Revelation. Um, even the old will become new. They will get into paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. So it's amazing that the church could function without the New Testament. If you go to liturgy early on before the Bible and the New Testament was written, and this gets read in the church, by the apostles, they will explain it in Christ because now the whole congregation sitting understand about this. How the early liturgies were looking like, um, we can actually talk about this separately, maybe you know, a couple of saints, but they will, um, but they can describe really, really well um, because they are writing defense for Christianity, how the church looked like. So Old Testament is telling, is telling me God loves me and he sees me very beautiful and he describes his beauty, how he sees me. Um, <clears throat> and then I tell him, I want to be alone with you. Let's go together to the field. Let's go and seek out our friends who did not come to the liturgy. Let's always vi visit the villages. It's not, there is no, the one who doesn't gather with me is scattering. So there is no idle existence. I either I'm gathering for Christ or I'm, I'm just scattering. Just to, just to stand still is scattering because the devil is working all the time in, 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 in scattering. So every, every person in God has to be always gathering. Um, being idle is, is a state of, uh, of scattering because by the virtue of what the devil is doing. So that's chapter seven, and it would lead had to cover it because m most of us were not here to cover this, and it it uh, it leads very very well to chapter eight. So let's open together chapter eight. Um, Tony, if you can read for us the first uh, couple of verses, and then let's go to the handout because there's very very nice commentaries we'll read together. Um, we'd love to be in the hand of the church fathers whom the Lord enlightened to give us um, how to understand the Bible. Oh, that you were like my brother, who nursed at my mother's breast. If I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. She who used to instruct me, 
I would cause you to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. Okay. Um, so she's talking to, as if uh, all that you were like my brother. So it's, it's like, I want to bring everybody to drinks from my mother's breasts. So immediately we think that this is somebody, the soul who wants to bring everyone to, to church. The mother's breasts are the church. And the, and, and the milk is the baptism. How do we become children of that mother? By being baptized. So now the soul that's just the, the evangelist, the preaching, that I don't want anybody to be away from Christ. So I wish you were my brother. I want to bring you in to, to, to drink. Who nursed at my mother's breast? If I should find you outside, I would kiss you. <laughs> I'm unbelievable. Like, can I invite everybody to have communion? And this is exactly what I, what I feel is that the, the mission of, of, of the faith is to invite everybody to have communion because people love Christ and we want them to have Christ in them, not by our own virtue, but this is by the, what's called the grace. God exactly saying this, oh, that you were like my brother. So anybody outside, which is the church, or who is, not which, not which, the church is a sheep, the bride of Christ, who is the church? So let's read it together in St. Ambrose. Um, Mina, can you read for us? Sure. The church the answers. answers. Oh, yeah. The first paragraph, yeah. The church answers unto <clears throat> God the word who will give you to me, my brother, you who did suck <clears throat> the breasts of my mother. If I find you outside, I will kiss you, and indeed they will not despise me. I will take you and bring you into the house of my mother, delighted with the gifts of grace. She longs to attain to the innermost mysteries and to consecrate all her affections to Christ. She still seeks, she still stirs up his love and asks of the daughters of Jerusalem to stir it up for her and desires that by their beauty, which is that of faithful souls, her spouse may be incited to ever richer love for her. So the love of the spouse will increase because she's bringing people to the spouse more and more. Okay, um, Tony, next one. What are the breasts of the church except <clears throat> the sacrament of baptism? Finding you without, he says, I shall kiss you. That is, finding you outside the body, I embrace you with a kiss of mystical peace. No one shall despise you. No one shall shut you out. I will introduce you into the inner sanctuary and hidden places of Mother Church and into all the secrets of mystery so that you may drink the cup of spiritual grace. So, uh, it's a longer passage. I summarize it because it's basically the main, the main two, two parts of it is that um, baptism and communion. And inserted between them is we being the temple of God. So he's not talking about the sacraments in details, but he's revealing to us how the fathers look at the books. of. When we see this, we see immediately how the fathers look at the book of the New Testament. Why do they look at it this way? Because this is what the church does, practices, lives. Uh, so immediately when they read these passages, it has to be described in the, in the, in the sense of the church. What, what else would it be? What else of a, of a, of a contemplation would be than really giving the reality of what's happening, what happened to you, what happens to every person in order to be born again and coming from, from above. So everybody who's outside, come, I want you to have the same, the same food that I had growing up. I want you to, have to, to, to be with my mother. I want you to get the food, the, the food from my mother because we're all the children of one womb, the womb of the church. Um, Finding you outside the body, I embrace you with the kiss of mystical peace. Greet one another with the holy kiss is not an invention for just uh, saying hello to one another. It actually tells us when you look at somebody in the church, the only reason you look at the person next to you is to give them a kiss. Any other, any other thing is no, so don't judge. We want, you want to look somewhere until the east look. So there's two places to look only. The east, when you look to your brother or sister, then this is for the reason of giving 
the case of reconciliation. And that is why the Lord said, if you offer your offering, you find that your brother has something against you, leave your offering <coughs> at, the, at the altar and go back and reconcile with your brother and then come and offer your offering. So the holy kiss, which means I want to kiss the whole world, which means the beginning of this whole book. God wants to kiss me. And he did. He did. That's why he frowned very, very, very much when, when Judas gave him up with a kiss. This was not haphazard. It's like how much... The kiss is a very big deal. Um, so to come and deliver him to death with a kiss is completely opposite. Like it's, we're not built to sin. That's why Judas had a very psychological problem and could not, could not repent. He went and killed himself because the devil now had an open field to enter. So playing with sin gets psychological tiredness and the person doesn't feel peaceful so the peace only comes with an apostolic kiss and that's why if you plan anything revengeful you will not have kiss for he gives his beloved sleep only those who are beloved of christ will be able to sleep well caroline uh, this part uh, is my favorite Emmanuel in our midst, but unknown. Ambrose, therefore she interceded so that he would go forth from the bosom of the Father, go out of doors like the bridegroom coming out from his changer and Chief. chamber, and run his course. She interceded, too, that he would win those who were weak, would not linger on the distant throne of the Father, and in that light, for those without strength cannot follow there. Instead, he would take up he would be taken up and led into the dwelling of the bride and her chamber, that he would be out of the doors for her, but within for us, would be in our midst, even though unseen by us. John 1, 26. So our Lord Jesus Christ was called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Not only God is with us, God is in our midst. Um, and this, there is one among you standing in your midst whom you do not know, whose sandals I am not worthy to lose. This is, in, this is actually John 1, 26, where, where in St. John's Gospel, he is telling us after in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him everything that was, and nothing that was what was without him, basically he made everything. He was the light. And the light shone in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. St. John, when he writes his gospel, he starts the same way as Genesis, telling us in the beginning and telling us about the light. But he's telling us also in that same day that St. John, when he saw Christ, when they asked him about Christ, he's telling them, it's not me, but there is one among you that you do not know. So it's going to take, it's going to take two types of people, those who know Christ and those who don't know Christ. Then it was not knowing him because he has not revealed himself, which is what, what, she, what this is in Song of Solomon, she's wishing, I want, I want everybody to, to meet you. I want to take you in. I want to bring everybody outside in. If I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. She who used to instruct me, I would cause you to, the, to drink the spiced wine of the justice of the Jews of my pomegranate. So um, we said in the previous chapters, I found him and I held him and would not let him loose in the Song of Solomon. So Christ is in our midst. Do we know him or not? This is the question. Do I know, do I really know Christ or not? Am I really worthy of being called a Christian? We were discussing in uh, St. Ignatius, who was the first uh, patriarch of Antioch was a disciple of St. John the Evangelist directly. He was martyred in the year 110, 107, 107. And as he, as he's going from Antioch to Rome to be thrown to the lions, the Christians of Rome trying to intercede that he would be spared from being thrown to the lions. An old man thrown to the lions, going to eat him up. So the Christians are trying to stop this. And he writes to them, as he, he writes seven epistles, seven epistles. One of them is the epistle to the Romans. I am afraid, my brethren, that your love for me would hurt me, that you're trying to prevent my, my, my martyrdom. 
And then he tells them, let me try to become a Christian. <laughs> so he does not feel he's a Christian yet unless he gets thrown to the lions. So he, he, and he says, don't let me try to run my race again. Please, please do not stop my martyrdom. And I hope that the teeth of the lions will crush me, that I become the wheat on the altar of God. Where would he get this picture except the wheat on the altar of God is the communion. So I want to offer myself to God as he offered himself for me. So back again and again and again, that, that, that backbone, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just yesterday is the Logos of God the Father. Today is incarnate, forever is incarnate. He will come again in his glory, in his flesh, with the resurrection. The rapture and the resurrection are one day. There is nothing preceding the other. The rapture is the good people rapture, but everybody will be resurrected. And this will be the final judgment and reward. Final judgment on the sinners and reward for the righteous. So it's, a, it's one event. There is, no, there is no time lapse that there is rapture and then there's another life on earth that will continue. This is actually in First Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 4. So Christ, this, this, this lover to God, I want to find you. I want to bring you in. I want to 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 just hold you and keep you. So Christ is now very revealed. Do we know him or not? And the only way to know him is to do what he asks us to do. The one who loves me will do my commandments. So John 1 26, there is one among you whom you don't know. I am not worthy to lose his sandals. This is the giant John the Baptist. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Maria? Yeah. Mary. Read it for us, Mary. The little ones love Christ. This is about to, to know Christ, you have to become like little children. This is the passage that talks about this. The little ones love Christ, usually the children in their faith and action, and girls, neither hold back the meetings of whom it is written. Thus have the meetings loved you, for they have brought you into the house of their mother. You may not then separate the little ones from the will of Christ to they proclaim so the prophetic exaltation is this book because it's Old Testament book, so it's prophetic. And this is the one that really, the, like the children, I want, I want him, I don't want anybody like him when you're you like fixated on a toy or fixated on a mission. In, in the simplicity of the children, they don't concoct or devise, it's just what they see, they like, and they want to have it. So, and God told us, unless we become back like little children, we cannot make it into the kingdom of heaven. You know, heaven is given to those children. And children don't hold grudge, don't revenge. They get, sometimes as grown-ups, we get hurt, really hurt. Um, but God is asking us to become in children, like children dealing with it. That if anybody, um, if anybody uh, affects you or, or it requires avenging, don't avenge yourself. Don't avenge yourself. The, the vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You just lit, sit like a little child. You go to mommy or daddy, tell them what's happening, and then they will handle it. You just enjoy your childhood or enjoy your innocence. Don't damage your innocence by behaving in a vengeful way. Last one. Um, I think this goes, uh, yes, with St. Athanasius, the, ti the timing. So, can we read? Emily, if you can read for us, God appoints times and seasons. He appoints the time for his incarnation. Um, Athanasius, thus the God of all, after the manner of wise Solomon, distributes everything in time and season. Ecclesiastes 3.7. Ecclesiastes 3.7, that every, everything under heaven has a time. There's time for planting, there's time for reaping, there's time for joy, there's time for mourning. Um, so not sadness, mourning to somebody is weeping, we need to commiserate with the person. So of course, in Athanasius, as this is one of his festal letters, he says there is time for everything. And the incarnation, this title I put by the way, that matches the, the passage, and which is which is here. It's about it's about timing. So he reads into this sincere also before him, but he didn't put his quotation, something to the same to the same meaning. So let's see how St. Athanasius looks at it. To the end that at the right time the salvation of humankind should be everywhere spread abroad. In this way, the wisdom of God, First Corinthians 124, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, passed into holy souls, 
making them friends of gods and prophets. That's in the Book of Wisdom, which is not in this Bible, but it's in the um, second canonical books. Although very many were praying for his coming and saying, Oh, that the salvation of God will come out of Zion. In the Psalms. The spouse also, as it is written in the Song of Songs, was praying and saying, Oh, that you were like a brother to me that nursed at my mother's breast. And the meaning of chat prayer is, oh. Oh, that. Not chat. Oh. <laughs> my fault. It would be nice to have a chat prayer. That's actually a good prophecy about what we should do. Uh, that, that's a new that's a new system we have in our Bible study, the chat prayer. <laughs> you prayed while sitting down. <laughs> oh, that you were like humanity and would take on human nature for our sake. Let me interrupt you here for a second. So he's quoting the song, he's quoting chapter eight, which is Oh, that you were like a brother to me that nurtured my mother's breast. So he looks at it like instead of inviting people from outside, he's looking that the, the old testament is looking forward to his coming. Like can can we really you really come and 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 and, and be with us as, as Emmanuel. So he, he that's why he interprets it. Oh, that you were like humanity, that you become human like us, a brother to us, and would take on a human nature for our sake. So you can see that the fathers can can look at it in different aspects, and this is why we we like their guidance into how to how to look at the scripture. But the common thing, they see the incarnation, they see the church, they see the New Testament in the Old Testament. That's why. For taking these books outside of the context of the church creates very, very uh, unorthodox, uh, unplausible meanings for what the what the Holy Spirit intended. Okay, after all, after all, it was God who set up times and seasons, and He knows our needs better than we do. Because He loves us, He exhorts us to do right things at right times, so that we may be healed. Thus, when the appropriate time had come, the Father sent the Son, just as He has promised. So, it says the letters of the letters that the Church sends to the whole world to tell it the world know when is the when is the feast of the resurrection, because it's a variable feast. So, the fathers of the Coptic Church were assigned since Pope Demetrius, the twelfth Pope, Pope Saint Athanasius is the twentieth Pope. Um, they are since. Um, since calculating the, the, the when is the resurrection is um, because of the cosmology knowledge they had in Egypt in, in very very advanced pharaonic calculation of the using the stars calendars so it became these festal letters to announce the resurrection it was not just resurrections on this day this week this sorry this Sunday in this week no it was it was announcement in one of these in one of these type of uh, of letters and it, it continued into Christendom uh, on and on. Uh, we'll take the next part three and four. So Taylor can you read for us this verses three and four in chapter eight. His left hand is under my head, his right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. So my simple comment here is God is hugging us. We are always in, in his in his in bosom. Um, and this appears in the architecture of the church. That the east of the church is called the bosom of the father, that he, he hugs the whole congregation. And he did it with the prodigal son. Independent of how, how the prodigal son smelled because of his sins and his mixing with the pigs, when he saw him, he kissed him. Again, the kiss, which is very horrific that, Ju that Judas would kiss him to deliver him. It, it's a great... Uh, uh, not even paradox, it's, it's completely opposite to what was intended by Kiss. And um, he's, he's, he's telling us, I, I just want you to be always hugged by me. And it's a personal, his left hand is under my head, not our, not a group hug. It's, it's an embrace. And God is able to embrace every single soul with whatever that soul needs and whatever the person is. So when we are there completely, we just say, ah, please don't stop it. Don't, don't, don't end this. Don't awaken love. Don't disturb love. Finally, I'm relaxed. I'm relieved. Um, and this kiss or this holy kiss as the congregation does it together, it allows all of the congregation members to have him kiss each one. That is by abiding in him and him in us by the infinite, dissolving into one another, which is abides in me and I in him, as 
John 6.56 tells us what the communion is, that, that I, I, we're going to, to fuse into one another. He did this because he became human, which is what Saint Athanasius said. When are you going to become human? When, I, when can I bring you to bring to, to drink from my mother's breast, which is converting this Old Testament church into really what it is? Please, can you become a human quickly? I want to hug you. I want to be with you. So the, the pleading of the humanity that God can take our shape and overcome, renew, um, which is the whole essence of the incarnation. And then after the renewal, when he ascends, it's not like, bye-bye, I'm going to come again after like whatever number of years. No, no, I'm with you. And not only I'm with you, I'm in you. And between communions, my Holy Spirit, who is sanctifying every place I go into, will be sanctifying you. So how would we get this interpretation unless, unless we enjoy really what we got for free um, to be... To be um, to be in communion with God. We'll stop here because um, today we have a, a meeting at eight. So I just uh, did this introduction. Chapter eight is unbelievable. And the ending of it is like, is like revelation exactly. Amen, come O oh Lord, come quickly. So the, the, the very last verse, I can cheat and tell you what it is. Verse 14, make haste my beloved, make haste my beloved. Can you come quickly please? and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. And we said that the theme of that book, Spices, means the cross, that he is going to give a different flavor to pain. God, because of the cross, now we can relate and we can find in tribulation an image that's spiceful, that's aroma smelling. Uh, if Christ was not crucified, no one would be able to be tolerating his life or tribulation. But when we look at the, the cross and we say in the sixth hour that he liberates us by his, his life-giving passion, that the pain now is liberating, not captivating. Only when we look at the cross. So the, the, the lady, the Shulamite, which is the beloved, the church, us, are telling God at the end of this book, exactly at the end of Revelation, can you come quickly, please? We can't wait anymore. We need you. To Christ is the glory with his good Father and the Holy Spirit. Thank you.